decentralizing technologies are reshaping our entire economy. And at Animal Ventures, our firm, we actually believe that the future economy is going to be built heavily around the fact that data is increasingly known, remembered, and computed against. And so I want to talk about one of the technologies that we think is pivotal to this future, and it's blockchain. But I want to start um, actually pretty far back, because blockchain technology is talked about a lot today in the news and in these sort of exciting ways, but we often forget to link it back to what's happening in our economy. What have we done for years, for generations, that's actually making this transformation something quite exciting? So I want to go pretty far back in time and back to our early agrarian kind of trade. In those days, our economy was based on exchanges of value where we really had direct control, right? We had one-to-one -one relationships. We had very small societies. And we were able to execute our trades and know exactly what happened. Now, over time, the distance, the complexity in our trades grew. And in order to deal with all of that uncertainty, not knowing who we were dealing with at the end of a given trade, we basically invented institutions. Institutions like banks, governments, uh, mercantile associations, marketplaces, you name it. All of these were really tools for us to lower our uncertainty about one another and help facilitate ex extending our trade. And so this story continues, actually, because very long thereafter, we put these same institutions online, right? We created digital versions of all the things we know, digital versions of banks, uh, digital versions of marketplaces. We have Amazon, eBay, Alibaba. All of these are really just similarly tools that allow us to expa expand our trade and uh, facilitate that exchange of value at a greater and greater scale. And they do this by lowering our uncertainty. Now today, what we can do that's quite different is we can use a technology alone to lower our uncertainty about one another and again, expand our ability to trade. And that technology is called blockchain. And what's kind of exciting that most people don't pay much attention to is that while it facilitates this sort of expansion in trade, it's actually taking us kind of back in time to those early agrarian days, because what it enables is a much more transparent view into our transactions. So we're going back to being able to have direct kind of one-to-one -one control over our exchange of value, but at greater and greater scale. And that's kind of the main point to keep in mind. If we think about blockchain as a continuation of a human story, it's a continuation of our ability to lower uncertainty and expand our ability to trade. Now, blockchain itself is um, kind of a buzzword. You hear about a lot in the news today. And unfortunately, it's not very visual. Uh, so the example I like to use, while many people tell me it's archaic, uh, is the example of a checkbook. And I actually think it's a pretty good physical analogy to what happens with blockchains. If you think about writing a check, which most of you probably don't do today, um, you're writing the terms of a deal, right? I'm going to pay you x dollars, and then I sign it, authenticating it, and then there's a set of numbers, and my bank and your bank use those numbers to uh, transfer the amount of money we've agreed upon. Now, if I wrote all of the checks in a checkbook, you kind of are left with that stack of carbon copies. That's essentially what a block of data is in a blockchain. It's a set of transactions over a period of time that are lumped together and then linked cryptographically to previous transactions. Now, what's quite different in uh, using a blockchain than using a check is that instead of our banks going and executing that transaction on our behalf, what we're using is a network of computers that are essentially running the same software and coming to agreement uh, on that block of data and then linking it to previous blocks. So we have no central administrator in these transactions. We each have the visibility into the transactions at any given time. And so if we continue the story of what is really economically happening, we can say blockchains lower uncertainty 
in our transactions, mostly because they're able to create a framework for something called shared state. Uh, and so this decentralized framework, it's really saying we have a shared reality. We're all looking at the same database. We're not trusting each other to perform a transaction or trusting somebody in the middle to perform that transaction on our behalf. Now, this story started about 10 years ago uh, with the publication of the Bitcoin white paper, which described the first sort of breakthrough in how we could do electronic cash as a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, but we've seen a lot of development in the last 10 years. It's not just about Bitcoin or the Bitcoin network, which is really architected more for the transactions of Bitcoin between accounts. And now we saw the Ethereum network emerge in 2015, its first implementation, which generalized a lot of the same functionality. How do we use a network of computers that are coming to agreement on transactions in order to uh, create new kinds of value? So the market um, has treated different crypto assets um, you know, with a lot of attention. They're looking at the volatility and what does this kind of asset really mean? But the truth is we pay a lot of attention more at the protocol layer. This is a really new technology. And even if you don't believe in the valuations of any of the sort of new startups or new networks, what you should be paying attention to is how many new protocols are being developed. What's being uh, architected that uses new forms of cryptography? And where are these sort of scientific advances happening in decentralized computing? So this is a lot of what we pay attention to, this core architecture layer, and we're seeing a lot of transformations there. And so we've seen a lot of new kinds of networks emerge. Different networks are focused on optimizing for privacy uh, in your transactions. Some of these networks are optimizing throughput or sort of the scalability of blockchains. Um, some of them are looking at optimizing for enterprise activity, and the list goes on and on. So we're starting to see a real sort of robust um, innovation happen at this protocol layer, and that's where I think a lot of the excitement is. And so something to hold on to as you start to analyze where blockchain is going, where this technology is leading us, is to actually think of blockchains as modern day, global, virtual, decentralized computers. These are computers. They're one reliable computer made up of many potentially unreliable computers. And people can build applications on top of them. And the computer analogy, I think, is, is relatively helpful because the stack for a blockchain is not that dissimilar from the stack we're actually used to dealing with in our digital lives today. Right? If you think about the world we live in today based off of the internet, we have core infrastructure that we don't spend very much time thinking about, TCP IP, the basic protocols that define our communications networks. Above it, we have middleware, right? different APIs and libraries that we use. And at the very top, we have applications, email, uh, Uber, whatever you have on your d given device. And the same is true for blockchain. Blockchain has core protocols that define a given network, whether it's the Ethereum network or the Bitcoin network or Definity. Um, they usually involve different kinds of consensus mechanisms and other core protocols. Above it, we have middleware. We have clients that allow us to write applications on top of blockchains. And then at the very top, we have applications. These are probably some of the things you've heard of in the news, but what they're based on is quite different. It's based on a concept called a smart contract. And this is kind of where this checkbook example comes in handy. Because if you think about a check, I had described it as the terms of a deal, right? Well, smart contracts are a very pivotal tool in the development of blockchains because what they do is they enable us to automate business logic, automate the terms of a deal. And they also allow us to automate governance, the conditions that we're creating. And so when we look at a check example, what we should be looking at is not just, oh, I agree to pay X dollars, but actually I can write the terms of the deal, and so long as they're computer readable, I can execute it across this network and know that it gets executed as written. So that's sort of the, the power of decentralized software, is it will get executed as written. You do not need a third party 
it will execute upon being triggered. So this begs the question, what do we use a shared computer for? What are people going to build on top of these technologies? For me, a lot of the interest in blockchain came from my background in governance. I was looking at what kinds of technologies change how we make decisions or how we transact or our trust in society. And I sort of went down the rabbit hole from there. Um, our firm, Animal Ventures, has spent a lot of time thinking about identity and identity management in blockchain-based um, infrastructure, as well as supply chain and asset tracking. How do you think about all of the transactions that make up a product from design all the way through to how it's made and then delivered? In some cases, you could even think about just the documentation that goes along with a product as being part of what creates its value. And for us, our process is pretty simple. We're a prototyping firm, so we work with different Fortune 500s and help them deal with a specific pain point where we're creating a hypothesis about how emerging technologies could address that pain point, and then we learn, we do a lot of research, um, a lot of user interviews, a lot of different kinds of activity. We do a whole build process that's really iterative prototyping where you're um, deploying your product in a weekly way and then essentially coming out of 12 weeks with a product that you feel achieves your hypothesis. And then we measure. We check how well we did. Uh, does it move anything in a business? Does it change any of our metrics? And then we start all over again. So we work a lot in supply chain predominantly. But supply chain is a really broad space, right? It's not just about the movement of physical goods. We're talking about many, many industries, everything from pharmaceuticals to uh, logistics, shipping, freight, uh, procurement, um, back office automation at times. These all go into how our products come to pass. So for us, we really think everything has a supply chain. Your digital goods came from somewhere. Um, your physical goods, your phone, anything that you're using on a daily basis came from somewhere and transacted a number of times before you started using it. And so supply chains are an interesting place to start thinking about blockchain and the implementation of this technology alongside other technologies. So supply chains have been innovating for quite a long time, right? We're seeing artificial intelligence in our supply chains. Um, that's sort of at the very top. They're helping us make decisions about where there's demand, doing better forecasting, predictive analytics. Below it, we have a lot more data, right? We're getting data from sensors about temperature or environmental conditions or whether we're low on inventory. We're getting data from uh, the smart machines we're putting into our factories and our manufacturing, as well as delivery. So all of these areas are sort of giving us a host of real-time information. But what we've been lacking is this bottom layer, this idea of network state. Most of the innovation that's happened in supply chain has been enterprise specific, right? So you might have better data and better decision making in your company, but you aren't able to share that information with maybe your suppliers or your data is siloed. And so this has created a sort of the, the problem in supply chain of dark holes. We don't have that much visibility um, unless you're you know, Tesla and you have a totally vertical supply chain, you're stuck dealing with your partners and how much information they may or may not want to share. And so this is an area where we're starting to see blockchain become very important. It opens up the possibility for shared technological infrastructure. And not just infrastructure for humans, because I think sometimes our, our imagination gets a little limited here. We think, oh great, this is a new way for us to expand how we do trade, we can share data, we can create you know, a, a data infrastructure that our companies will use. Well, really, the goal here is actually robots need an infrastructure. We're not just talking about expanding human trade, we're talking about the ability to automate transactions made by machines. And machines need context and rules, right? They need an ability to uh, know what's going on in a given system and when they're supposed to transact. And this is already happening. We already have you know, machines that have wallets, essentially, and purchasing power. And it's only going to continue to grow. So a lot of what we should be thinking about is 
this idea that machines need shared state. They need a shared reality, because how else are they supposed to use information correctly and make decisions based off of it? So this sort of future of more automation, um, you know, greater speed and real-time transactions for our companies, for our economies, is kind of hinging on the idea that we have some kind of shared infrastructure by which machines can make decisions autonomously. So this idea of state that I've talked about is kind of vague. Uh, it's not a word most people use in everyday conversation. And so the example I like to use that's a physical example is of a turnstile. If you were going through a turnstile, you are basically changing its state, right? You're, in the past, dropping a token in there, or you're uh, using a subway pass, and that's the input that allows you to then move forward and become part of the subway system. So really, state machines are just tools by which you're sort of creating an input, and that input changes the system in a way, and you have a new, a new output, a new state. Now, where this matters is that our state machines that we're used to dealing with, we control individually. You control your own computer, right? You're the central authority managing how it um, doles out its resources. But what happens when we have a shared computer? Well, we actually have to share the resources of that computer. And they're finite. They're not infinite. We have only a certain amount of computing power based on decentralized networks. And so managing that resource requires tokens. Um, this is a lot of where sort of the token economy comes into play when we talk about blockchain. They're a tool for us to manage computing resources. If you think back to your own computer, you've probably seen a sort of a task manager if you have a PC or an activity monitor for a Mac, which is really just this tool that's telling you, hey, you have Spotify open and you have your Chrome browser open, and I'm going to manage accordingly how to you know, delegate your CPUs. I'm going to prioritize different things based on what you have open, what you're using at any given time. And so that's basically what's happening with blockchains. We have tokens that allow us to manage the network, manage the computing power, and ensure that nobody also spams the network, um, consuming most of that computing power for themselves. And so if we think about um, this idea of state awareness, and needing to have greater visibility into what is a given network state at any given time, um, we actually should start thinking about it as the tool that's going to unlock a lot of our future. Because it's not only for humans and for the supply chains or whatever business you might be in that we're going to need greater information, greater detail, um, greater verification of that information, but we're actually going to need to be able to share that information with machines reliably and transact back and forth. So a lot of our work is in this space. We think about it from the supply chain perspective, but you could really look at it from any perspective. Um, this is really the tool that unlocks those higher level um, intelligence and data sharing capabilities. So we ask our clients to think about what is your level of state awareness, and I would suggest you think for yourselves about what is your own level of state awareness. And if you want to think about it further, we have a 70-page white paper, um, mostly on the future of supply chains, which we call asset chains. But this is really an exploration that goes uh, beyond blockchain to include AI and IoT. Thank you so much.